Thank you so much. Thank you, Russell. Glad you're back here. We missed you. I hope uh, that you realize we do pray for you, my friend, when you're traveling and speaking at all these different conferences and meetings and whatever. But you know, as I was <clears throat> searching my heart and searching for the right message in this hour with our nation facing so many things, when I hear about North Korea, the first sitting president that has ever faced the leader of that nation face to face is scheduled to meet in a few weeks face to face with Kim Jong Un. Now, friend, if there's anything in in my heart, I say without apology, it's praying that God will work a miracle that will affect the entire world through that meeting. Now, that's not impossible, my friends. With God, all things are possible. But I want to tell you that everybody in this room tonight and everybody listening to this message is either part of the problem in our world or part of the solution. I submit to you there's no neutral. There's an old song that says, neutral you cannot be. And I want to ask you tonight to pledge with me to join me in praying and pledging our faith and allegiance to remember our nation every time we bow our knees or bow our heads or our hearts that we'll lift them up. You know, the time has passed when we worry about being politically correct. The only thing that really matters for believers is to be biblically, scripturally correct. And we read a moment ago in the words of that hymn that we were singing, Be strong, be strong in the Lord. Be of good courage. Fear not, the Lord said, I'm with you. He said, I'll be with you. That's his pledge, his promise. I'll be with you all the way, even to the end. Now, whatever that means, I'm going to be there at the end of whatever's going on in our nation, whatever's going on in my life, my ministry. The only, only way I know to say it is that uh, my opening introduction, I have this old Bible in my hand that I carried from 1961 Let me be sure I'm right. I have it written down. You'll notice it's uh, put together with clear packaging tape. It was in pieces, literally, and I rescued it. I spent two hours Saturday morning, Russ, on this Bible. I'd like to get a hold of John Zedicola's big Bible. I don't know if it's beyond rescue or not. But I've trimmed the pages with a sharp pair of scissors, and I've glued it in the back. It was in pieces, I mean literally. And it's amazing what you can do when you want to. And you know, I, I was curious. I wanted to look through this Bible that I preached from for years. I carried with me in every revival the first several years that I started traveling. And I started preaching in this in 1964. 1964. I left Water Tower Baptist Church. They presented this to me as I left to go to Mobile, Alabama and become pastor in that uh, city there, right during the heart of all the racial strife and tension going on and people were marching you remember and uh, the governor of the state of Alabama was standing on the front steps of the Capitol building and I won't go into that in detail but I tell you I remember all that and I remember going to that church and taking a stand I said before you all vote on me now before you call me as your pastor 
I want you to know, and I say this for all of you listening on the internet, not to boast about Kerry Miller in any way, but I want you to know where I stood and where I still stand. I said, everybody of every color is welcome in this church if I become your pastor, and the day they're not welcome, I will no longer be your pastor. Now, if you know anything about history in America, you just think back to 1964, and you'll know what I'm talking about. And uh, I haven't changed what I feel at all, that Jesus died for all men of all colors and all countries, every culture, every country in the world. He died for the world. He gave his life that all who want to come can come. He said, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, come follow me. Come follow me. But you remember there were a lot of them who rejected him. You know what his word was? You will not come to me that you might have life. Now what is he implying there? That you have to come to Jesus for eternal life. But when you refuse to come, there's no other way. There's no hope for you, my friend. Now, I know people don't like to hear the negative notes. But I want to say a, a battery in your car cannot give you power with two positive posts. It has to have a positive and a negative to produce power. I submit to you that preaching, preaching on TV or radio or the local church or even in a meeting like this, wherever Jesus is lifted up. He said, straight is the gate, narrow is the way that leads to life, and few there be that find it. But he said, broad is the way, wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many, I say, are going that way. Now that's what Jesus said. Now don't tell me that's out of style, my friend. If that's out of style, then everything in this book is out of style. You can't just take the passages that make you feel comfortable. That remind you of God's grace and goodness and forgiveness. You have to take it all. Because we're going to be accountable for everything that's written in this book. And the Lord reminds us in the book of Revelation, that great revelation that, gave, that he gave to John when he was in exile on the Isle of Patmos. He said, don't change a word. Don't change a thing in this book, the book of Revelation. And I think that applies to all of God's word. Because the Lord said, I'm the Lord thy God who changeth not. Now if he doesn't change, his word never changes. Society may, the world may, preachers may, theologians may change their mind about things, but God never changes his mind. So I submit to you, friend, in spite of what the liberals in America are saying, there's only one way to have power with God. And it's found in the chapter that I turned to when I opened this old Bible. It fell open. It was amazing to me. I mean, I mean, God really spoke to me. It fell open to Romans chapter 12. And I said, well, you know, that's the first chapter that I ever memorized when I was 16 years old my freshman year at Southwest Baptist College for my English professor, who was also my speech professor. Her name was Mamie Hamlet. And she encouraged me to learn how to memorize scripture. And she said, now when we come back to our next class, I want you to, whatever you, whatever you feel led to memorize, I want you to share it with the class from memory. Mm. I, I never knows any prompter. Hey man, listen, I was 
I was winging it. And I had memorized, with all the other stuff I had to do, I had memorized the 12th chapter of Romans. And I looked and I had almost every verse in red ink. You know, I have notes all around it, Russ. <laughs> if you want to see it after the service, I'll let you see it. But I, I want to tell you, it's a mess. Can you see that? Yeah. Can you see that? Yeah. It's a mess. Now, when I when I glued this back together, I promise you that it still wants to open at Romans 12. Uh. God said, now you started your ministry. I was called to my first church right after that. And I had to preach... Uh, I only had three sermons. <laughs> and I had to preach two sermons a week. Boy, I mean to tell you what, now that, I had to get those sermons. I mean, that was a lot for a young preacher. Praise God that I grew up in a preacher's home and went to church from the time I can remember. And I heard some great preaching. And I learned, you know, that you, you at least have to have three points and an illustration or a poem at the end, right? And we used to laugh about, uh, are you a three-point preacher or a two-point preacher? And then I went to preaching class and learned that there's different kinds of sermons, you know. You can have one point or two point, or you may just have a jewel, you know, a jewel sermon? That's where it's like a diamond. You just hold it up, and you just, every facet of it, as you move it in the light, you know, reflects, right? So here's a man that just takes a passage of Scripture and just brings it out and reflects on everything that's said in that passage. Yeah. So that's what we're going to do tonight, all right? Okay. This is a jewel sermon. Wow. Because if there's a diamond in the Bible, this is the chapter. Mm. Now, we stopped short of this when we were teaching and preaching the series in Romans. But I'm going to instruct Daniel, who's recording tonight. We're in parenthesis now, Daniel. You add this one, you know, after all those others in the 12th chapter. And uh, we had, excuse me, we had never finished that 11th uh, chapter. We got to go back to that. But I really feel in the light of all that's going on in America and all that we're facing as Christians, as believers, we talk about, you know, are we going to be persecuted? Like we hear about these folks that are being persecuted for being Christians in other parts of our world. And man, it sobers me, friend, when I think of all the 12 men that followed Jesus. They all, history tells us, they all died as martyrs. Now, friend, Jesus had warned them. If any man would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. But we're also reminded that Jesus said, if all men forsake you, I'll be with you to the end. And you know, Peter, he got all excited that, Lord, I'll follow you. Jesus said, Satan's going to sift you like sifting wheat in a wheat field. And you remember Peter's denial and betrayal. When he had made a pledge, Lord, if everybody forsakes you, I'll be with you. And he went out and wept bitterly because of what he had done, I'm sure, when he went back to that seashore and Jesus found him the next morning and prepared breakfast and Jesus turned to Peter and said, Peter, do you love me? Do you really love me? Ask him three times, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know I love you. What do you mean? He said, then feed my sheep. But he said, you know what he said twice before that? Follow me. I wonder tonight, are we following? Russell has his lost sheep lunch every day. The men meet with him. Men that are in recovery. Lost sheep lunch. 
Well, now we're not implying that they're all lost. But the last part of the 12-step program is that if you've come to know the Lord and the power of His resurrection, as Paul would put it, and the fellowship of His sufferings, they go together. Peter said, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God. You know, you ought to rejoice. Like James tells us, when you're called on to suffer. When you suffer various trials, James said, be happy, be glad. You say, well, you're crazy. No, that's the Bible. And I'm just pointing to those scriptures tonight to let you know that all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution of one kind or another. Now, it may not be to get your head chopped off, but I want to tell you, friend, the Bible even goes this far. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with this scripture or not. A man's enemies shall be those of his own household. Right. Now, friend, if you've, ever, if you've ever been persecuted by someone you love dearly, somebody in your family... I mean, that's pretty deep. Make fun of you for, or maybe call you a fanatic for being a Christian. Well, now listen, if you live according to Romans 12, now remember, Paul's writing to Gentile believers here in Rome. All right? He's never met these folks, but he's on his way. He wrote this letter. You get to the 12th chapter, he puts it all together. I told Arch as I was trying to mend this old Bible. And I said, honey, if you throw all the rest of them or give them away, somebody, you save this one. You be sure Keith gets this Bible. It may not be as valuable as Billy Graham's, but I'm here to tell you, friend, it's sure valuable to me. I'm reading from the King James tonight, if you want to flip to that, if whatever translation you're reading because I feel like this is the one that we've heard all of our lives but we missed some of it so I'm gonna I have the NIV right here by me so I'm gonna I mean the NLT rather the New Living Translation right by me so I can compare these on a verse or two that I think are so important he said I beseech you therefore brethren he's writing to the Christians out in Rome who had already become believers and Paul said, I want to come remember in the first chapter. He said, I've been praying and longing for a, a trip to come and see you, but I was hindered. I was not allowed. The Lord wouldn't let me come. He'd been praying a long time to come, right? right? He said, I want to have some fruit among you as I have among the other Gentiles where I preach. So with that in mind now, let's remember what he says here. He said, I beseech you, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Oh, man, I remember the first day I read that when I was 16 years old. I'd, I'd heard it before. I'd heard preachers preach on it. I'd probably heard my dad preach it as a young boy, but I didn't remember it. But I want you to listen to the New Living Translation of that verse. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you. Notice the strength of this scripture. I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. See? For all he has done for you. Let them be a living and a holy sacrifice the kind he will find acceptable. How many preachers tell people when they give the invitation, now remember, when you come to Jesus, you say, I'm going to follow you and live for you. Whatever it takes, wherever it leads, whatever it costs, I'll pay the price. How many right up front are honest with folks who come forward and let them know what they're in for from the get-go? You say, well, not too many people would join it, would they? Well, I'm afraid you might be right. I think that's why we have churches full of lost people, to be honest with you. The Bible said, many shall say, Lord, Lord. You know, the scripture said in Romans 10, just back a couple of chapters in this, from where we're reading, 
And my pastor here quotes it every Sunday. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Call on him for what? Call on him to do what? To save you from your sin and sinning? To save you from the way you've been going? The way you've been living? Think about it. All right, now, stay with me. Don't leave me now. I know it's already 7 o'clock, but stay with me. Verse 2. And be not conformed. Not conformed. Don't, don't miss that word. I have that underlined in blue ink and red ink in my Bible. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind mm. that you may prove what is good and acceptable to God and perfect. The perfect will of God, the King James said. You know why some people never come to find out the perfect will of God for them? Did you want to know the perfect will of God from the moment you stepped out to follow Jesus? Had anybody explained that? Friend, I confess to you, I grew up in church. I didn't understand that. Now, I was saved. To the best of my understanding, the best way I knew how, I turned all I knew of myself over to all I knew and understand of Jesus. Understood. Excuse me. Whatever I understood at that point, I, I knew when I walked down that aisle, my life was going to be different, that I had to do what God said. I'd heard enough preaching to know that. I'd had Sunday school teachers that helped me, even as a young boy, to understand. I heard songs like Living for Jesus, A Life That Is True, Striving to Please Him in All That I Do. I knew what that meant. So I didn't have to, I didn't have to learn all that after I made my decision, see? And I want to apologize for those who came forward with a sincere heart but nobody took them under their wings, so to speak. They didn't have sponsors to disciple of Jeff. They didn't have people like we encourage our followers to do in, in uh, recovery. We just shook their hand and said, God bless you. We're glad to have you in our church. <laughs> oh, my goodness. We sang songs like... Uh, I mentioned this some time ago. We're one in the bond of love or something like that, you know. But notice this. Let me read this. Let them be a living and a holy sacrifice, the kind we find acceptable. Excuse me, I didn't read that right. The kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. The way that he will find acceptable. Now it might be acceptable to you or to others, but it's not acceptable to God unless it's holy. That means set apart unto him a living sacrifice. Man, that doesn't sound too enjoyable to me. The very word sacrifice just, man, I think about an animal being sacrificed in the Old Testament. I heard all those stories, you know. And what we mentioned last Sunday night about Abraham offering up his son Isaac. God said, take him up and offer him up as a sacrifice. Well, he didn't have to go that far. God sent an angel and said, hey, hold the phone. <laughs> hold everything. Now that I know you're willing, see? See, God wants to know if we're willing. Mm. You know, I've ever every time I've rededicated my life, I knew when I really meant it. Huh? And I said, Lord, if you'll just forgive me one more time. I'm serious. I'll do it. Now how many times can you do that? Well, sometimes I have to do it several times a day. I don't have to wait till the fall revival 
or the spring revival or the spring retreat. I called a lady today. I was wanting to get an eye appointment. She's a, an optometrist and an ophthalmologist and a, she works for a, an optical company. I want to get a appointment to take a drive, I mean an eye test to get my driver's license because I'm past 85 years of age and they won't give me an acceptance of a new driver's license because I'm 87 come March the 20th, the day I have to get a new driver's license. So I've got to go get an eye test. But you know what? I told the Lord I may have to have glasses again because I've been wearing glasses I did since I was 35 or 6. I needed bifocals. But when I went to take an eye test after I got out of the hospital, they said, you don't need glasses. I said, I've been wearing glasses. I don't have to wear glasses when I drive? No. And I read that, you know, I got in the machine and I looked and I read it right off, both eyes. I bet I couldn't do that tonight. I, I feel like I got a weak eye or I'll see. And I got these, as Grandpa said, I got these store-bought glasses. <laughs> you can get them for a dollar at the dollar store. And that's what I'm using to read to you tonight. But I want to say this. There are a lot of people that have never seen what God's saying here through the Apostle Paul. He said, I want you to present your body, everything you are, everything you ever hope to be, I want you to present it to God as a living sacrifice. Now, you know, sometimes it would be easy for me just to go down and lay down and die for Jesus. But he doesn't want a dead sacrifice. He wants a living sacrifice. He wants every day of my life, as I preached some weeks ago, he wants me to die daily. He wants me to give up my right to live my life my way. Now look, I want to read this translation again. This is truly the way to worship. This is the way to worship. Some of this so-called worship is a joke before God. Believe me. But now look at verse 2. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Amen. Now, how do you like that translation? Yep. That's a living Bible, brother. Amen. That's the... the I want to say it again. That's a recovery edition right there. Reborn. Amen. New creation. Change the way you think. Now I want to ask, you know, people say, do you know when you were saved? You know, I want to ask you, do you know when God changed your thoughts, your thinking about things, about sin and sinning? Amen. When I first was saved, I was just crying my head off. Amen. Mama says, you weren't all that bad. Yeah. God convicted you. So yeah. Her mother tried to talk her out of it. She's not that bad. She's a good girl. You know, I've had wives when I'd go to visit their husbands at their invitation, okay, and I'd start saying, Now, brother, you realize you're a sinner. Now, why was that over there? Well, you know, he's really he's really a pretty good guy. You know, I said, Now wait a minute. I'm trying to I'm trying to get him lost and you're trying to tell him he's all right. Yeah. And to think that God could love me. I could never could understand that. And then when, I don't know, I guess it was only God that was wanting me to see the light of day. Yeah, but he knew your heart. See? Yeah. He knew your heart. Well, it, it's deep stuff here, friend. Mm. Look, I haven't even gotten divorced too, and I'm out of time. I'm sorry. But don't, no, honey, be, it's not your fault. But don't copy the behavior. <laughs> Look, and customs of this world. But let God transform you. Now I want you to remember, he's writing to believers. Right. See? Yeah. 
He's not writing to unsaved people. He's not writing to lost people. He's writing to believers at Rome. Okay? Now, what I'm trying to say is this. A lot of believers, most believers, I assure you, have to come to a point in their life, whether it's through a trial, a hardship, uh, call it discipline in your life, you know. Paul said if you're without chastisement, you're not believers at all. Whatever God has to do through our through his chastening hand, his correction, that's a better word, through his correcting hand, mm -hmm. it's worth it. Right. You know what I saw in this Bible? Let me tell you something else I found. I was looking to see what I, what I had written on all the pages, <laughs> and I looked to see if I had missed anything. And I looked back here in the very back, And I had written down Forgive me now. You know this Bible's kind of sticky. Start every service with the song It Will Be Worth It All. It's in a revival I was preaching. We said that week I was going to start every service in that revival. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face all sorrow will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. You know, I'm going to have to change the setting on this pad. Because it wants to go off before I'm ready for it to. Now, if we let the Lord change our way of thinking, it said, then we will learn to know God's will for us, which is good and pleasing and perfect. To know God's will. How do we know God's will? We have to make a presentation through a separation. You got it? Presentation, separation. Then we have what? A revelation. God reveals His perfect will. Some people never get that revelation. What's God's plan? Before He gets into spiritual gifts in the 12th chapter, we'll do this next week, He starts talking about to each one of us is given, you know, a portion of faith. And He talks about, this is one great chapter on the gifts of the Spirit the gift to preach well and to teach and so forth. But most people don't ever read this chapter with that in mind. It breaks my heart. The Lord tried to show me when I was a young man what it, it took me 10 years to figure out. Preaching every Sunday, preparing sermons every week, preaching revivals. I still didn't have a clue. And I wrote in my Bible in 19... 56. Now I started preaching in 1946. Ten years later, I was in a revival. And I wrote it down in this Bible. The most important periods in my life. Here it is on this, on this page right here. Look at Russ. See that? These were my Bethel experiences. You know, back to Bethel. I wrote this down. Oakdale Baptist Church, 1200 Gale, Mobile, Alabama. That's where I went after I left Water Tower, where they gave me this Bible. And I put down here in July of 1956, after I'd finished the seminary a year before, in 1955, in, the, in July of 56, in Irving, Texas, in the Hilltop Drive Baptist Church, a preacher talked to me about how to be filled with the Spirit. Mm -hmm. 
August the 14th, 1978, West Palm Beach at the Holiday Inn, room 214. I found a Gideon Bible open to Psalm 32, and God spoke to me. Every time John Glenn used to read that chapter, I'd think about that experience. I'd forgotten when it was or what it was, but it's written down in this Bible. Dark, don't you lose us. In August the 4th, 1978, Psalm 34. God spoke to me again in a fresh way. That was during that time, right after that, that I surrendered to go into evangelism in 1979. Mm. About the time Russell was saved. And when he tells me how long he's been saved, I said, man, he... I can't believe it's been that many years. Where did all those years go? And I was preaching revivals all across America in different churches every other week. Every other week. And you know what? I was preaching these same principles, and I didn't realize it. It's all in chapter 12 of Romans. Every bit of it, Russell. And you know what? Russell blew me away a while ago. He's doing his homework. Somebody gave him. Who was it gave it to you? BSF homework. It's Romans 12. Romans 12, his BSF homework this week is Romans chapter 12. Now, I didn't know that when I prepared to preach this. I didn't know it until I got here. I had my iPad open to Romans 12 when he told me that. I about freaked out. Don't tell me God doesn't work in mysterious ways, okay? Now, I just want to introduce this tonight because I wouldn't even begin to to go into all this, but I want to go into the, the last two verses of the chapter and show you when we come back, the Lord willing, next week, what God's teaching us. I want to read it out of this book. Please bear with me. If it be possible, verse 18, as much as lieth in you, as far as it's up to you, see, each one of us, uh, very personal here. It's singular in the Greek. He points to each person individually in this letter as he writes these words. If it be possible, as much as lieth with you, as far as it's up to you, live peaceably with all men. I think the president needs to put this on his desk. Before he goes to this conference in North Korea, he needs to read this verse. As much as it's up to you, be at peace with all men. Now, he doesn't talk about lost or saved, red, yellow, black, or white, no color, no culture, no country. It's all men. And how it goes on to say, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. Don't try to get even. You see the progression of this? Avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will replay Isis. I will repay all these people these persecutors of Christians around the world. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. You say, I'm going to get that guy if it's the last thing I ever do. I want to get him. No, you're not going to get him. You're just going to get in more trouble. You're going to grieve God in the process. You're going to short circuit the Holy Spirit in your life. You're going to quench his power. 
You're going to miss his purpose and his plan for your life if you take things into your own hands. Here it is. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Now, here's the last verse of this chapter. Now, remember the chapter divisions are supplied by the translators. So they figured this is the end of what Paul's saying in this portion of scripture. Listen to this. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. How many liberals believe that? How many of the guys on fake news are practicing that tonight? I don't listen to that crap. Pardon me. No. Oh boy. <laughs> My mother said, son, you're going to say that in the pulpit one day. You better be. <laughs> Her prophecy came true tonight. <laughs> Oh, Lord. Everybody in TV land, forgive this preacher. See, preachers aren't perfect. I'm not perfect. I'm still trying to learn. I started with Romans 12 and 16, and here I am, 87, and God isn't finished with me yet. Now, we already went, thank God, in Galatians the other night. If you have to be perfect to be saved, forget it. So salvation goes by doing what the law demands. Christ died for nothing. <laughs> oh, Russell. It's great. You yeah. got me now, boy. Good. Good. You got me now. So I just thank God tonight as we close this service that Paul showed us, and I, I started at the beginning of the chapter with the conclusion of the chapter. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Are we doing that as a nation? What about individuals? Whew. As much as life with you, as far as it's up to you, live peaceably with all men. Now, if you miss everything we said tonight, don't miss the last verse of the chapter. Now when we do that, we've taken the first step to living victoriously. I wonder why Paul waited till the end of the chapter to say that. You know what? He quotes something right here. If you, when you get home tonight, I want you to look up a verse. In Deuteronomy, chapter 32, verse 35. God said, I will take revenge. I will pay them back. You don't need to do it. I'll take care of it. See, God has a plan. You remember... You remember when Samson lost his hair in Delilah's lap? And the Bible says the hair of his head began to grow again. And did you know that God answered Samson's prayer to avenge against his enemies? He sat between the pillars of the temple And with the strength only the Lord could give him, he pulled those columns down. And of course he died in the process. You know, I think America needs to wake up, my friend. If God's word is our, is our uh, instruction book as a nation, We better learn 
to live peaceably with all men. Now, I know that sounds like double talk when I started out strong tonight saying we need to take a stand. But there's a way to go about it. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we ask you tonight to open our understanding anew and afresh to this great portion of Scripture in Paul's letter to the Roman uh, believers. Father, we realize that uh, it's difficult for us to set ourselves in the setting of this book. To be in Rome and to realize that Paul had been in prison and, and uh, he's burdened for these folks and he's trying to give them the best that he has after all these years of traveling and preaching and evangelizing and, and discipling people. And Lord, we know that these must be important words in this letter. We just can't study them too much. We just can't do anything. We can memorize them like I did and, and still miss so much. So Father, open the eyes of our understanding tonight as Paul prayed in the Ephesian letter, that the eyes of their understanding would be open, that they might know the hope to which he had called them. That's what we need tonight in our own life. We need the eyes of our understanding to be open. Lord, I thank you this week that you took me back down the steps in my own life and how you showed me step by step at different periods when I was walking away or maybe just missing the point. Or maybe I was just standing still and marking time. I really wasn't going anywhere. Just going over the same messages with different people over and over and over. And then, Lord, you showed me again that to go on, I had to live according to the world, the instructions that Paul gave this great group of people. Lord, may it be personal that I to each one of us. May those who are listening take their Bibles down or their iPad or whatever. Take the scriptures in the chapters that we read tonight. And I pray, Lord, that you'll become real to them in teaching them how to live in victory. Lord, if there are those tonight who've never trusted you, as we said at the beginning, they've never turned from their sin and their sinning and Turn to the, the Savior for the salvation and the victory that he offers us. We pray, Lord, that they'll do it tonight, even when they finish listening to this message. Lord, that they'll find a place alone somewhere and get along with you and ask you to come into their heart and cleanse their heart and change their heart. And as Paul said, change their mind about the way they're living and not to live like the world around them but to live as Jesus wants them to live. For it's in his dear name we pray, even Jesus. Amen. 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 Russell's going to lead us in our hymn of invitation. In our invitation hymn tonight. Hyundai that's parked out here. Anybody have a Hyundai? This is uh, 280. Our invitation him. Jesus, keep me near the cross. I'm to play it right now. Jesus, keep me near Trembling. 
so clearly when we're willing to open our hearts and be honest with ourselves and honest with you and honest with others. Lord, we know that there's nothing too difficult for you. And we know there are people tonight listening and who will be listening in the days to come that are struggling in their Christian walk. And some, Lord, are just struggling to understand what it means to be a Christian. And Lord, we pray that you will open their heart and their mind. And above all, that they'll open their heart to you and invite you to come in and be their Lord, their Master, and their Savior. Oh, Father, may they know the joy that's found in being right with Jesus, having a personal time with Him every day, to walk with Him and talk with Him. Oh God, may they come to know that peace that passes all understanding. Again, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, folks. Yeah. 
preaching the gospel, preaching the New Testament. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad you were able to get it together. It's great. Man, I tell you what, I knew I had to, or, or it was just going to be worthless. The baby, what that, you know, that is so thin, it'll stick to anything. All right, that's great. It's great. And I glued the binding first. Shot glued that flexible glue that yeah. they use at the libraries to repair books. And I had to take the scissors and see it's still not perfect. Dean wants to talk to you. Oh, I'm sorry, Dean. I, I, I feel like I finally have gotten to know you. Yeah. You, you finally so get to know After all these years. Yeah.